Today's program is part of the award-winning series, Profiles in Literature, featuring interviews with persons prominent in American literature for children. The moderator of this series is Dr. Jacqueline Schachter-Weiss. Natalie Babbitt arose around 5 a.m. to fly from Providence, Rhode Island for this program. We welcome this distinguished children's author, illustrator. Happy to be here. Joining me is my profile's guest, oh, colleague, <laughs> Carolyn Field, Coordinator Emerita of the Office of Work with Children of the Free Library of Philadelphia. Nice to see you back in Philadelphia, Natalie. <laughs> Thank you. On the left, we see the view of the home Natalie Babbitt left so early this morning. Why did you first move to Providence? We had two reasons to go there. One, uh, my husband was very much attracted by the academic philosophy of Brown University, which was something he was very much in sympathy with. And two, it's very close to our house on Cape Cod. I see. So your husband took the job and that brought you? Yes, that's right. To Providence. Yes. We see a view of her husband. When do you use this view that we see of your Cape Cod home? When do you use it? Well, it's, it's winterized, so we can use it all year round. But we're there uh, mostly in the summer and, and warm weekends, spring and fall. But we always have Christmas there with as many of our children who can, as can come home for it. From Cape Cod comes this portrait of Natalie when she was only three, done by her artistic mother. Following mother's footsteps, Natalie did this drawing when she was in third grade. What's the duck doing? Oh, what is the duck doing? I think he's just sort of walking along a path, if I recall. Not ice skating? Maybe I he is ice skating. I think he I is. guess he is ice skating. Uh, please introduce us to your three handsome children, giving their names, ages, and occupations. All right, Christopher is the oldest, and he is 34 years old. He's a, a uh, clinical psychologist in Wisconsin. Uh, just got married in September. Oh. August, excuse Congratulations. me. Congratulations. In August. Uh, and Tom is, a, is 32, and he is a rock jazz guitarist, and he lives in Boston, trying to find a job to keep bread on the table while he does his music. Mm -hmm. And Lucy is the youngest, and she's 30, and, and she is a writer also and has published two novels for young adults and working on a third while she takes care of two babies. Why haven't you done the jacket art for her books? No, I, don't th I, think that, I think that's not a good idea. I think that's not a good idea. I mean, after all, we are very much alike in a lot of ways, and uh, she could do the jackets herself if she wanted to. Oh, really? But I think it's best that I keep my hands off. We, we shop talk together, but her career is quite separate from mine. And she writes more fantasy, doesn't she? A different kind of fantasy, because after all, she grew up in a different world. I see. Uh, you now have two adorable grandchildren. Yes, indeed. Tell us their names and ages. Peter is two. He was two on the 1st of September. And Maggie was born in May, so she is about six months old. Her name is Margaret, but my daughter's married name is Frateroli, which is kind of a mouthful, so you have to be careful about what names you put with it. Nice. My son-in-law is an absolutely wonderful, wonderful young man. I'm very fond of him. He teaches acting, does he, he? No, he doesn't teach acting, but he, te he always directs the show. He's a high school teacher, uh, but he teaches English, and, and Shakespeare is his, is his love. I see. We may see him on the stage one of these Perhaps days. so. Perhaps so. As uh, lovable as your grandchildren are, let's not forget your dog, Rosie. Oh, Rosie. Poor Rosie. Which of your <clears throat> pets have served as models for your illustrations? Almost all of them have. The dog that we had when our children were growing up, a fat, wonderful mutt named Alice, appears in Ninoch Rise. Uh, stars in Ninoch. Uh -huh. Various cats have, have served as models, and Rosie is now serving as a model for the picture book I'm working on now. Oh, oh, yes. oh isn't that she's, exciting? She's very excited about that. She wears a cap and bells. She plays a court jester. And, oh, my goodness. She, she hates great. Ella she hates that, yeah. but she likes to pose. <laughs> oh, I think that's lovely. Well, Natalie, your first illustrations, published in 1966, were for 
the 49th Magician, oh, yes. written by your husband, Samuel Babbitt, in two hours. That's right. Isn't that appalling? Yeah. The, the medium is, uh, uh, you use is what? Because the art is excellent. That is a rapidograph pen, and that was a sort of a new tool in those days. What it is is a fountain pen that uses India ink. Uh, and, and the lines are all the same width, that there's no flexibility to a pen like that. That was a lot of fun. I never thought about writing in those days at all. Why did you switch to writing your own books then? Well, Sam didn't want to do any more writing. Oh, and so, and nobody came to my door after this, after that book came out saying, please illustrate <laughs> my book. So I had to, if I wanted to keep on being an illustrator, I had to start writing. Well, your first uh, solo book was uh, Dick Foot and the Shar, Correct. published by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, mm -hmm. with Michael DiCapua as right. your editor, who is still your editor. And he was our editor for The 49th Magician as well. Oh, he was? Yes, so he then was. he moved to uh, He Farrar. moved to Farrar Strauss, and I went with him. Mm -hmm. oh, well, uh, why did you do Dick in verse? I didn't think I could write prose. It never occurred to me. I'd written verse when I was young, when <clears> I was <throat> a child, and, but I, I never thought I could write prose. Well, I love your second picture book, Phoebe's Revolt. Yes, that's, that's survived a little better. <laughs> yeah. I think the drawings of uh, Phoebe rebelling against the Victorian uh, frills are just marvelous. I, I also know that you are left-handed. Do you ever have trouble uh, illustrating with your left hand? No, you get quite used to it, after all. No, it doesn't give me any problems. It's not like writing, in, in that you don't paint overhand the way you write overhand. Uh, you paint with your, you know, this way. So that is not a problem. But then you went on to write prose, and your first book in prose was The Search for Delicious, right. which is shown here in paperback and hardcover editions. Uh, it, it's written in a fairy tale style. Yes, it's, I would it's say. a pretty typical fairy tale. You, uh, you are certainly right when you say that water mm -hmm. is the most <laughs> delicious, and I'm telling you this is the story, but it's a wonderful book. The, the book uh, was listed in the New York Times as the best book for children ages 9 to 12 in 1969. Yes, isn't that amazing? That, uh, quite a George while ago, took and it's took still, to it. as you know, it's still going on. And it, the characters' names are simply marvelous, very unusual. Hemlock is a villain. Um, Mildew is a housewife. <laughs> but I understand that you also have unusual names among your relatives. Oh, yes, the one no, the not like those. Land land names, <laughs> the names in the Search for Delicious all, with one exception, have other meanings, which are rel you know, relate to their characters right. in one way or another, except for Ardis, the mermaid. And her name comes from a very beautiful secretary that my father once had, which I had a beautiful name. But my, fam my father's, well, both sides, funny, funny names in my family. Not anything you'd want to give to your children or grandchildren. Who uh, was uh, identified with a famous landmark? Which famous landmark? Uh, Pike. Oh, oh Pike. Uh, Ze Zebulon Pike. That was in my. That was my mother's family. I a, see. A, an uncle. I see. And I was very proud of that. But my husband, who was something of a student of American history when we first knew each other, after I bragged to him about Zebulon Pike, oh. who he told me tied with Pike's Peak. Right. Mm -hmm. Told me mm -hmm. that he was actually a traitor later on. So. Oh. Oh, I didn't oh, really? know Yes, that. he was in cahoots with uh, Aaron Burr. Oh, I did not mm -hmm. yes. know that. Well, that's well, unusual, too. Well, I guess so, yes. Your 1971 Newbery Honor Book, Ninoch Rise, is shown in both hard and paperback editions. It demonstrates your penchant for universal themes. What do you regard as the primary theme of Ninoch Rise? That book comes directly out of my remembering how very angry I was when my sister told me there wasn't any Santa Claus. Oh. Because even though I know Christmas is not about Santa Claus, and I certainly knew that when I was a child as well, nevertheless, it took all the magic out of, out of Christmas for me. I really think that people need some mystery and some kind of magic in their lives. If, if it were not true, we would not keep sending people to look for the Loch Ness Monster. Uh -huh. We would not keep watching for UFOs. And these are not children doing these things. These are adults. Those things are important in our lives. That's interesting to hear you say it. And yeah, this is way. why the adults in Ninoch Rise don't want to hear that the there truth. is no monster. You're right. They probably know already. Uh -huh. Meg Roman. Right. right. Uh, my pupils have a question to ask about Ninoch Rise. You may have heard it before. They argue that uh, Uncle Ott, after he left 
instep to go to the mountain peak. Obviously didn't return for food because no one saw him and re refused to descend the other side of the mountain because he was waiting to be rejoined by his dog Annabelle. So they want to know, how could Uncle Ott have survived so long on mm -hmm. a mountain peak without food? You tell your students to read it again because he does come down and it is his face that Aunt Gertrude sees in the window. He has come down to get Annabelle, but presumably he's also stocking up. On food. Oh, yes. all right. Okay. <laughs> An answer for every question. Uh, yes. <laughs> I have to tell you, though, that uh, it's, it makes a lot of sense, to, because that book inspires young people to think, Good. as does Tuck Everlasting. We see the jacket of Tuck Everlasting, your U.S. Honor Book of the International Board on Books for Young People. The jacket was inspired by this view of Babbitt's Pond in Forest Port, New York, in the Adirondack Mountains. Why do you believe Tuck Everlasting is your most popular book? Well, you know, that term popular is, is difficult. I, I don't really know what children like, but certainly it is the most popular with reading mm -hmm. teachers. And I think it's because there's lots to talk about in connection with it. Uh, that's either a good or a bad thing, depending on your point of view. <laughs> uh -huh. Tuck Everlasting exemplifies what you advocate in children's books explaining complex problems in simple terms without obvious solutions. Mm. What complaints have you heard about the killing of the man in the yellow suit without <laughs> someone enduring <clears throat> long-term punishment? The children never ask about that. It's very interesting. It's only the adults. The children, I think, I feel about that killing the same as they do about the killing of the Wicked Witch of the West in The Wizard of Oz. He needed uh -huh. killing, so uh -huh. he gets killed. Uh -huh. They are not troubled by that because children have a very strong and uh, black and white sense of justice, I think. Right. Uh, so that's not what they ask about at oh. all. Okay. I sort of agree with you there. I had a sense of that this was a righteous killing. Um, tuck is an old word for life, yes. so your title, paraphrased, is Life Everlasting. You create interest by showing the minuses as well as the pluses of immortality. Mm -hmm. What complaints have you heard from readers or what reactions have readers had to the ending of Tuck Everlasting. It's, it's fascinating to me because my mail runs about 50-50 on the way the story ends. The most telling piece of mail I've ever had about the ending was when a little girl who was then 11, I believe she was from Texas, wrote to me and she was very disturbed by the way the story ended. Very disturbed and she wrote a very articulate letter about it. And I wrote back to her and, and said it was perfectly all right not to like the way it ended because since we can't, live forever anyway. There's no right way to feel about it. But I said to her, it would be so nice if you would write to me again when you're 17. And I know you probably won't remember to, but she did. Oh. She, uh, six years later, I had a letter from the same now grown girl, and she told me that she had changed her mind. Oh, well, that's interesting. So when I talk to children in school about, about it, I tell them what I think is true, that it is something that you feel differently about at different times in your life. Mm -hmm. Is that the main problem? that's come up concerning Tuck Everlasting, the ending? Yes, that and, that and how the tree could be destroyed. And that, I, I don't think we have time to go in, into yes, all of that could, here. It, it's rather long. I finally, I got so many letters from children wanting to know since the tree was right by the spring right. of eternal life, how could, how could the tree be destroyed? And that, in the beginning, that came as a great surprise to me because the tree is destroyed by lightning. And I just thought, and I realize now I'm much too old, I should have realized children don't learn this kind of thing anymore. I thought everybody knew that lightning was a symbolic weapon of the gods. I see. Uh, there's more to it. The tree is an ash tree, which is related to old tree religions in northern Europe and all that kind of business. And it takes a long time to explain it, so much so that I wrote it all out and have it Xerox, and I just mail out the, the oh. answers. But, but it's all figured out. The thing that surprised me most was that I didn't, it's not that important to the story. And yet it is the thing that has, has piqued children's curiosity. Ah, I'm glad I asked. As a cat lover, 
I adore your Nellie a cat on her own. Oh, thank you. Which is your first four color yes, picture book. Yes, it is indeed. And Nellie is a cat marionette she shown is. in these pictures mixing with real cats. Uh, w when you came down today, you brought something s uh, special with you. What I did. That? I brought Nellie herself in her hat. The, ah. the, the marionette. Indeed. Did you have the, the marionette especially made uh, after the book, or was it, uh, be, did you write the book because you were given the marionette? No, I made that marionette. And this, the story about Nellie is an old story. I've had it in mind for about 15 years, and originally it was going to be a girl marionette, which I made also. There was something about it being a girl marionette when the old woman died that was too painful. Oh. And I decided that, and, and all the animals were not all cats, they were yeah. a variety oh. of animals, and I decided mm -hmm. I didn't like that. And it would be much more interesting, and I could make the point in a, in a more powerful way, in a sense, that's a strong word, but anyway, by changing the girl to a cat and having all the animals be cats. It's the same story, but because you change the cast, mm -hmm. uh, it makes a big difference. I think so it's I, so better I with Nellie. all the cats. I, I, do I like too. that. I, I do, too. It's great. And Nellie is made out of exactly yeah. what the book says. She's made out of broom, broom straws, yarn, and wood. Oh, for heaven's sakes. Yeah. Well, uh, and then another fantasy that also is very humorous. It, wait, excuse yes. me. You did carve that. It's not difficult. It's like carving she butter. Carved. She carved, carved that. Carved the, yeah. the, the It's uh, not hard. It's, it's like making basalt wood. Ba balsa wood. Balsa. The, the wood that, that boys used to make model airplanes out of. I see. Very readily available at any craft shop. <laughs> She's so able. And talented, uh -huh. yeah. Well, uh, uh, as I was saying earlier, another fantasy uh, story, which is a great great book, is The Devil's Storybook. Oh, I now, love why that. did you write two, not just one, Devil's Books? Well, that was, they're 12 years apart, oh, which accounts yes, for some of the true. differences between them. But the first one was quite successful, much to everybody's surprise. And so my editor, who doesn't usually talk about economic matters, said, listen, uh, the first one did so well, why don't you do another one? So eventually I got around yeah. to it. But they are different in some ways. I'm different. Twelve years, it all make a difference. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are, because I, I read both of them recently, yeah. one after the other. The difference is slight, yeah. but, it's, but it's there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which of your books have been adapted by Disney? None, but movies have been made of two of them, and, and they simply turn up occasionally on the Disney Channel. Oh, I see, I see. because of, I've, I've seen them advertised on... Uh, Yes. And um, which are those that do? Uh, uh, Talk Everlasting, and I, uh, it's not a movie that I like at all. I'm hoping someday there'll be a better one. And uh, The Eyes of the Amaryllis. And the same young, group of young uh, directors and technicians made both movies, but there was almost no money when the Tuck movie was being made. It was made in Buffalo, New York, and the producer was the Catholic Archdiocese of Buffalo, interestingly enough. Uh, and, and I think that the, the economics of it were one of the things that made it difficult. The Eyes of the Amaryllis, same director, same uh, technical people, but they had a lot more money. And so the actors in the Amaryllis movie are professional actors, whereas they're not in Tuck. Well, The Eyes of the Amaryllis has sort of a mystic quality to it. Uh, where did you get the ideas for this? As I understand oh. it, you planned this over a 10-year period. I did. The first image that came to me, and I don't know where it comes from, my son, the psychologist, could tell me oh, probably, yeah. <laughs> was the image of the uh, figurehead floating in to the beach. And I thought, gee, that's kind of interesting. And it took me about 10 years to figure out a story to tell around that, which is not normally the way I work at all. But the ocean is a very special thing to me. Having grown up in Ohio, in a, well, we moved up to Lake Erie when I was 11, which is the same age that Jenny is in Amarillo's when she sees the ocean. There are a lot of similarities. All that water, it's very impressive. Good. Now, uh, Goody Hall was a Book World Spring Festival honor book. And I understand that you consider that your favorite book. Now, why? It's my favorite of my children's books, and it's the least popular. I like it because I think it's funny. <laughs> and also, um, there's more personal stuff in it in a way, uh, well, not more than there is in Nellie, but in a way, Goody Hall is the conversation that I would have had with my mother if she'd lived long enough for me to have a conversation. Well, in other words, uh, is Goody Hall sort of a prototype of your mother? No, but Mrs. Goody is a little like my mother was. Mm -hmm. uh, in what sense? Tell us. Well, ambitious for position in the world, at the expense sometimes of although she wasn't as bad as Mrs. Goody about that because we always had dogs and <laughs> things like that. But, but there were a lot of similarities. And, and, a lot, and that kind of thing has its good parts and its bad parts. There are a lot of drawbacks. She's very different mm -hmm. from you. Yes. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. In that regard, uh -huh. although in other ways, I, I think. Oh, you're artistic. Like, yeah. Like what I like, I like the word jokes and the word games in, in that book, and that's what's made it less popular, I think, with children don't have the patience right. for it. Or that. I think it is a more mature book in a sense. than some of the others. It uh, would appeal more to adults than to children. British children have liked it better, actually, ah, but, they, well, but they know more about Shakespeare, perhaps. That's right, and they read uh, a, far, a little advanced to perhaps. our American children perhaps. in general. Uh, what, what can you share with us about your current uh, Oh, book publication. I am having so much fun with this. It's going to take years to do, I think, because all of the characters, it's about a king and a queen and a prince, and this is, the, the models for this are my son and daughter-in-law and, and Peter, my grandson. I started it before Maggie was born, so she's not in it. I'll have to do another one for her. But all of the characters are in it. The, my other, I'm in it. My, the other grandmother is in it. Both grandfathers, all the uncles and aunts are posing for various characters, and our dog, Rosie. Now, this is not a, a picture book. This yes, is it is a picture it book. It is a picture it book. It is absolutely oh, a picture wonderful. book. The story is very and simple. And it'll be in four color, oh, yes. like uh, oh, Nellie? Oh, yes. I'm sitting there every day with my magnifying glass painting. Oh, I think that's Even marvelous. my editor is in it, in uh, the end papers. Uh, so. do, do you have any idea when we might expect it? Uh, if we all live long enough for me to finish it, maybe in two or three years, four years, maybe. I don't know how long it's going to take. Mm -hmm. Your actual picture? Is in the book? I'm painting everybody's portrait. It, it, it's crazy. It, oh, it's absolutely it's crazy. It's going to be fun to well, see. I will, we'll, we'll see. The story is pretty sentimental in a way, but if my editor likes it, then that's all I need, and he does. Good. So. Good. Well, now, you write, have written mainly for children in around the fifth grade. Yes. Now, is, uh, of course, Nellie is a picture that's book, for younger and ones, this yeah. new one will be a picture book that will uh, suit all yeah. levels. Well, I don't more, know. Mostly the younger. I think, although. Yeah. No, well, it's the for little children kids. like picture books too. Depending, they on the might subject. like this because of the golden retriever. Our dog Rosie is a golden retriever, and golden retrievers are very popular. Mm -hmm. Who knows yes, why children are. like books? I, you know, who, it's impossible to say. What draws them? Well, we'll we'll see. We yes, indeed, wait we will. <laughs> um, how do you feel about limiting vocabulary in children's books? I think it's a bad idea. You, uh, I get you letters from children saying, <clears> "I really like your words," mm -hmm. and I write back and say, "They're not my words. They're everybody's words." I think it's. A, I think. You, I think we do children a grave disservice by trying to limit their understanding because the fewer words they have, the more difficult it is to express themselves. I, I we're not. We weren't any smarter than they are when we were children, mm -hmm. and we had books with hard words, and we mm -hmm. learned from it. Like so. humiliate. Well, all and, the words in in, in Kipling. You know, we read a lot of just so stories. Those right. are difficult words. Th that was not written down in any way, shape, or manner. No. Uh, how do you feel about uh, children's books having happy endings? I have lots of discussion with people on this. So. If it's natural to the course of the plot, I have no objection to that at all. I like happy endings. I, I think that most people who <clears throat> work in the children's field are fundamentally hopeful people. And certainly children uh, embody the whole idea of hope for the future. So I don't have any objection to it unless it's kind of tacked on afterwards mm -hmm. and, and it's fake. And, and children know that, so there's no point in trying to fool them. That, I think that's very true. But in general, children books should have happy endings because it gives them something to look forward to. Well, in, yeah, in I, I, as I say, yeah. I, I mean, I believe in happy endings. Tell me, has Michael uh, DiCaprio ever rejected one of your manuscripts? Indeed he has. Has he oh, really? Oh, my goodness. Two completely finished novels. Oh, that no. surprises me. The first me. one uh, I sent in, and he called me up and he said, Natalie, this is the most self-indulgent mess I ever saw. And he was right. Uh, I wouldn't give you a nickel for an editor who yeah, thinks exactly. that ev everything you write should be published. That is a bad idea. The second one, uh, he didn't like either, but it had a chapter in it about the devil, and that's where the devil stories came from. Oh, oh. I see. You uh, nothing on... is ever a waste. Uh -huh. I tell children, and they, and they understand exactly what I mean, because they ask me if I've ever had anything rejected. I say to them, have you ever handed in a paper in school that you knew wasn't really very good, but you hoped the teacher wouldn't notice? And that's exactly the way it was. They say, oh, yes, they, you know, they know what that is. That's exactly the way it was. I knew they weren't very good, but I sent them in anyway. Well, so you got the, the devil book from one. Have you ever worked, on the, worked over these books uh, since no, then? No, no, they are <clears throat> deeply flawed, <clears throat> and there's no point. But, but lean things. The first one, uh, I got most of the characters for Goody Hall from. Mm -hmm. The main character, Hercules, felt right. He didn't have that name, but he came out of there. And Alfreda, the gypsy. But it makes Michael DiCaprio be more credible to you. Yes, and that's extremely important. Mm -hmm. 
they, he, there are a group of us who are lucky enough to work with him, and believe me, we are very lucky indeed. He's a very special man. Has well, he's smart been lucky man too in his uh, authors and illustrators, Natalie. So let's. He, well, he's not been. Uh, I don't know in his that. case. I don't think in his case it's luck, though, Carolyn. I, because he has a lot to choose from, and well, he chooses true, with but. care. Mm -hmm. um, but for us, it's luck. Mm -hmm. How does he work with you? He never messes with ideas. I see. What he does is identify problem areas, but not, he does not offer solutions. He is extremely fussy about punctuation and syntax and all that kind of thing. Uh, I've learned a great deal from him that I've been able to pass on to writing students. One of the things that he has taught me that I think is very important is watching out for word repetition. Mm -hmm. When I was working on Herbert Robarge, which is my favorite of all my books, even though oh. it's not for children, um, he called me up and he, we were working on the galleys and he said, you've used the word shrugged three times in this novel, two times must go. And he's right, because there are certain words which stick in your ear, mm -hmm. uh -huh. and every time you use them, they're weakened. Uh -huh. uh, oh, I but, see. But he things really like that. reads. Dr. Weiss does the same thing with me. She's always saying you don't use uh, the same word over and over and over and uh -huh. over and over. These are, these are things yeah. that you can teach writing students. There are a lot of things you can't. Right. Well, do okay. you uh, when do you send him an idea and no. say, or oh. do you send him the a final manuscript? When you, or your, I your usually final don't manuscript. tell him what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, I and and I don't I don't tell anybody else much either. Mm -hmm. I I get it all done. I mean, for instance, with the book I'm working on now, I did a complete dummy before he had any idea what I was doing, mm -hmm. and before he knew he was going to be in it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> in, I, in one picture. I can hardly um, wait. And, and then, then I wait, and it's mm -hmm. terrifying. It doesn't mm -hmm. get easier, which is funny. You'd think it mm -hmm. would get easier, but it doesn't for any of us. Right? Did you do a lot of reading aloud to your own children? Yes, constantly. And uh, do you read aloud to the grandchildren? Haven't, well, yeah, actually, I have a little. When I, was I saw there, a picture of you with the, uh, yes, with the book and yes, the child oh, and one of the children. That is so fine because it, 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 it echoes all sorts of things. My mother read aloud to my sister and me all the time. My father, too, sometimes. Uh, my daughter and I have continued to read aloud, well, up until the time she got married. We've read Dickens aloud to each other. And I, certainly I read to her and my sons, and now she and her husband are reading to Peter and Maggie, and I also get to do that occasionally. It's wonderful. Books are wonderful. Well, I think reading aloud is very important, and it librarians is. and teachers emphasize that constantly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you feel there's any special responsibility on the part of children's authors compared to adult authors? Oh, boy. That's a hard question. Yes. I think, <laughs> I think that there are some responsibilities, but I don't think they're the ones that you might suppose. I, I, I think that, that, that people have thought for, for a long, long time that children needed to be protected and that that was the responsibility of the, the writer of fiction for children to protect them from the hard truths of life. I would say the opposite. I think it is our responsibility to let them see the world as, as in as real a light as we can without having it be a downer, that there is a balance. I believe in mm -hmm. balance very much, and I think that needs to be there. Thank you very much, Natalie Babbitt. Thank you. Natalie Babbitt's four ALA notable children's books are The Devil's Storybook, The Eyes of the Amaryllis, Ninoch Rise, and Tuck everlasting. When Babbitt was a 1989 ALA Wilder Award nominee, Anita Sylvie, nomination committee head, said, if I had to choose one book from the past 20 years to take to a desert island, it would undoubtedly be Tuck Everlasting, a novel that seems to improve every time I read it. Natalie Babbitt writes for varied children with insatiable needs for love and power. She recalls from her childhood injustices that she faced. For example, uh, a minister's daughter stole <laughs> dolly underwear from her and her sister. And Natalie remembers that mother didn't protest. Childhood is not tame. 
Our guest of long memory writes for children what she humorously calls a Thanksgiving feast of good literature, not a mid-morning snack. Thank you for coming. <laughs>